Thank you, Senator. Senator Rubio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, you, as you, I'm sure you're aware, Florida is no stranger to floods. I think, as last count, nearly 40 percent of all the national flood insurance program policies come from Florida. I think it's the largest state contributor to the program. In fact, people in Florida pay four times more into the program than they receive in claim payments. Mm -hmm. They have numerous businesses, insurers, constituents, local governments, of course, are expressing a tremendous amount of concern over not knowing how FEMA determines actuarial premium mm -hmm. rates. So what are your plans? What are FEMA's plans for updating disclosure and transparency and how it determines uh, the determination of the basis for risk premium rates? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, is, it is true that uh, to date uh, Florida has not received payouts uh, uh, at the level that, uh, that have been paid into premiums. That was also true for New York and New Jersey prior to 2012. And so a large event, uh, and you know this very well, if a large hurricane hit Miami-Dade, hit the Tampa area, uh, there would be profound um, payments that would be made out that would well, uh, well exceed um, uh, the kind of payments we saw in the Sandy scenarios. Um, I have been working um, with the recently departed uh, uh, insurance commissioner there in Florida because there's been an interest in how are we setting our rates. Uh, and some of them have asked me to disclose um, all of my loss history and the like, um, and what I've had to do is work under the Privacy Act. I can't hand all of that data over. Uh, so I have uh, sat with a number of the folks uh, from uh, Florida and have begun to lay out a path, particularly given this reinsurance piece, by which how can I go through the modeling for reinsurance in a way by which I can provide the data they want to see. We have released um, our, um, our actuarial um, practices guide. Uh, but folks want to see more inside that on a policy-by-policy -policy basis, uh, and we are working in tandem with this reinsurance effort to provide much more data about um, the policies, the payouts, and the pricing. You mentioned the Office of Insurance Regulation, and you remarked in a letter to them that FEMA is constantly reviewing and refining its rate-setting methodology. So while you continue to refine this methodology, how, how are we going to guarantee people in Florida, middle-class Floridians and others, who bear the brunt of these rate increases, that their rates, in fact, are not excessive. They're not in inadequate or unfairly discriminatory. I mean, how do we, uh, in essence, what, what, what exactly is FEMA going to do to complete its guarantee of fair and mm -hmm. uh, equitable rates for, for the people of the state of Florida? Right. So if I set aside the part of my book that is the grandfathered or subsidized rates that are set, uh, there's congressionally mandated um, subsidies and discounts that I put in place. But if I look at the actuarial part of the book, um, we look at an entire class and we do meet the standards and we've been audited and reviewed to say, yes, these are actuarially based rates. Um, what I have taken on just this spring is an, an effort to take some pieces that the National Academy of Sciences gave me last year uh, and look at the risk rating methodology, uh, which I believe is antiquated, much of it uh, rooted in the 80s, um, and says we've got to advance down this path. Uh, over the next two years, I think that we'll be able to demonstrate recognizable progress on that, and I believe you'll see elements of transparency as part of that. Well, one more point. Uh, Pinellas County in particular, which is in the Tampa Bay region, uh, it has more NFIP policyholders than 43 states. Uh, it recently received an award for an initiative. What they did is they created an app that uses open data to better map the area's parcels with flood zones in order to save property owners potentially millions of dollars on premiums. So that, that's an example of the kind of innovative solution that localities have, been, have the ability to create. So how does FEMA plan to empower these sorts of local initiatives, such as the one we saw in Pinellas County? I'm familiar with, with that one, uh, and it is based on some data that we, um, we put forward. Um, we're doing this in two ways. We're moving the technology side at a national level, uh, and we're also ensuring that our data is open source. And you're talking in that instance particularly about the uh, flood risk data so that at a local level they can use it and push it in a way forward. Uh, through our mapping efforts, uh, which Congress, uh, we appreciate, has restored us back to the higher levels uh, of funding uh, that we had not had in the preceding five years, uh, we're making more of those investments in the technology and the data. I'm particularly interested in ways by which I can take those data and set them up so that app developers can take them and move them in the ways that best meet the needs of locals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the indulgence. Uh, Mr. Robles, thank you for being here. Mr. Robles is a Floridian. He came up to Washington to uh, 
to testify on this important topic to the state of Florida. Let me ask you, if flood insurance premiums were as high as they are today when you, started, uh, when you first started your business, would your business have been able to start or grow the way it did? Uh, certainly not. Certainly not. Uh, um, in, in especially when you have a limited amount of resources, as you well know, the home building business is very entrepreneurial in that nature and is very cash intensive. And um, anything that's a threat such as that as to the affordability of housing certainly is a threat to the very essence of what we do. Um, so, no, I would not be able to. And being in the Tampa Bay region, you have a uh, unique perspective that you bring to this panel, and that's your business's work in constructing homes for the active duty service members that are there at, uh, in the different facilities. Uh, what kind of challenges have you seen these America's servicemen and women face due to these uh, premiums? So it's, um, it's a very unique challenge. Uh, we do 25 to 30 percent of our best business uh, among the active and, and retired military. It just happens to be McDill Air Force Base located in, geographically in there, which are, contributes $6 billion to the, con the local economy. Um, however, there's a housing crisis within the Air Force Base based upon its uniqueness of being attached into an uh, urban setting. And unfortunately, for the active military who work off a base housing allowance, um, any increase in the flood insurance rates um, severely impact their ability to find housing with that a within that area. And then fundamentally, they, it's almost a double-edged sword for them because if they are not a, a candidate for a home for a, a home purchase, even the rental market is further exacerbated because obviously rents go up quite significantly and they pass that cost on to the active servicemen. So, and some have requirements that they be uh, within X distance of the military base based upon what their particular assignments are. So it's especially oppressive for our active military. In your testimony, you mentioned the cost of elevating a property or making a change to the, uh, to the flood map. How do inaccurate maps affect affordability? Um, well, if I could equate every eight, every eight inches in in my particular business, every eight inches of inaccuracy would would equate to almost six thousand dollars in hard costs. Uh, Mr. McKee, uh, one of your recommendations for reforming uh, NFIP was uh, encouraging the expansion of. Uh, the mar private market options. So I'm a co-sponsor of the, uh, the Flood Insurance Market Parity and Modernization Act, which would allow private flood insurance, as determined by state regulators, to be accepted for meeting the mandatory flood insurance purchase requirements. Could you just describe how would a private market best be able to complement the NFIP? And to that point, how would the expansion of a private flood insurance marketplace end up benefiting both consumers and small businesses? Well, Senator, thanks, thanks for the question. I think what property owners are looking for is options. Um, there really are none for them right now. So as the NFIP rates continue to go up, they are at a loss for what to do. They certainly don't want to walk away from their property, yet it also makes it um, uh, tough for them to find a buyer for it. I think what the private insurance industry getting into the market will do, again, is give them some options. Now, if they go into the private insurance market uh, and the rates on that go up, one thing with the bill is it does give them the option to come back to the NFIP program with, without losing that grandfathering clause uh, that most of them are being priced at right now. So we think that's a great thing that would help homeowners um, go back and forth if they need to. But as realtors come into my office and they say we have a property the owner cannot afford to uh, pay the NFIP rates and they can't afford to sell it. What are their options? It's tough for me as a broker that's been in this business for so long to say you really don't have an option at this particular point. And I think that's what our consumers and our property owners are looking for. Well, in your testimony, you mentioned how many property owners may be overcharged by your quote here is potentially thousands of dollars under NFIP, end quote. And that's due to the NFIP's one-rate table for premiums across the whole country. What kind of opportunities does a private flood insurance marketplace pretend for ultimately bringing about lower premiums? Well, I don't think it's going to be a quick fix, obviously, because I think the, the private insurance industry is going to have to come into the market and they're going to have to assess their uh, risks in the market uh, for the uh, flood insurance program. 
But I do think, again, if they go in and they look at some areas where we have flood zone A that, that covers whether you're a coastal property or your property away from the coast, but you're basically looking at the same rates, my hope is at some point that they will be able to maybe narrow those rates down where you really pay more in line with what the risk is for your property, if that makes sense. Great. 